So, so thank you very much for uh, being here. And um, this is such an immense treat. And it would have been for a treat. Us. Well, <laughs> that's how I feel. I mean, this whole, you know, from the lectures to this house to just being with people We're and to, this, to, to the care they've been taking of us, you know, with the food and everything mm -hmm. and the technical people that making it work. So I can't thank you enough. And, uh, and Dennis and the Academy and Annette and the technical team again and the sponsors. And last but not least, my dear friend, Nigel Gary who I believe had a word on this. And um, I've never been in a meeting that, um, that we can, that, that spreads along such a range of subjects and we can talk about neurochemistry and love. And, uh, and it's amazing how all of these dimensions at the end are intertwined. And, um, I also want to thank the previous speakers because many parts of my lecture have been spoken already in a much better English, so you know you also benefit from that. And I have to tell you that I'm probably the only one in that that sent you the lecture on April 15. Yes, absolutely. Right? <laughs> and I've, I've never heard of that before. And as my colleagues, I do the lecture to the very end. But there were so much weird things about this one that I thought they would do something about it. So I sent it. So I want you to know that because you're gonna see how many things in the lecture that I sent more than a month ago has been spoken by other people during the lectures. So I think that's a big magic as well. So let's see. So I'm not going to preach for the converters, converted, but this is the case for natural products, right? Uh, I highly recommend, let me see if I can, I highly recommend for those of you who were interested in understanding a little bit of the chemistry that makes a very good case for natural products and drug development, these two papers. I'm not a chemist, I should know more chemistry than I actually do, but these papers are so well written and so well argued that it's very, very good. But anyway, that tells you something. More than a third of the new drugs approved by the FDA for whatever it was, in the last three, uh, 30 years was either based on natural products or their derivatives, you know that. But basically, natural products have the chemical characteristics that make them high in the drugability world. You know, the Lipinskin's rules and all that. <coughs> they feed the molecular, uh, they feed, they, they occupy more um, parts of the proteins of the targets in the body that are interested as drug targets than non-natural products. And they feed them better and smoother. And that's very important as well. And so it's not surprising that the vast majority of all marketed drugs have a close match in natural products. So you please be adding. Now, the case for ethnopharmacology and CNS and, and psychopharmacology, and as you can see, and you all know, yeah, I trust you all know the drugs. We have stimulants, antidepressants, analgesics. We have antipsychotics, ravofia. We have anticonvulsants, neuroprotectors. And hundreds of papers that validate, validation papers. I hate that part. I hate this, the, the way of conveying validations. I know I've been playing with the ethnopharmacology definitions in the last five years ago, I know that Michael Henry did a little experiment with you guys and asked for definitions. Monica went back to this now. And I love one by Dan Mormon, who says that ethnopharmacology is us looking at the way they use their drugs. And this is a big, big mistake. And, and, and I want to argue that this is part of the reason we are not getting there and we're not coming out with the innovative drugs. So, 
Norman Farnsworth, who I trust uh, all of you know who, were, who he was, in 1984, he was already asking the question that I'm asking, you know, how can the devil be dry when it's filled with water? This is a famous paper by Norman, you know. And my question is, you know, are the foods actually too high or we've been not looking at it as the way we should, you know? So where are the drugs? First, I would say, and I'm talking about ethnopharmacology, right? So there are, there are no systematic ethnopharmacological search for drugs. Not by those who can develop drugs. It's not a university task. It's not a professor task. It's impossible to develop drugs in the university. We can do discoveries, but then it has to be developed. So, oops. Um, that I know of, there was Shaman Pharmaceuticals, a not very long-lived company in California, and they came out with a drug. It's the first botanical drug that was approved in more than 15 years. And not only that, they created a new category in FDA, the botanical drugs, because the drug that was approved is a mixture of purified polyanthocyanins. So they opened a big door, right? Jaguar Health, which is, is the company that's being continued by the same people from Shaman, and now they have, you know, uh, they set up a, a, what they call the Antinogen Therapeutic Initiative, and they put together ethnobotanists and ethnopharmacologists, some of which are here. I'm part of it too. I was part of Shaman's consulting team as well. And they're looking into this now. Um, some have argued that the low yield and the complex structure of natural products have prevented its development. We overcome most of the technical problems for uh, uh, the, the, the elucidation of the structure. And um, we have so, much, so many techniques now for growing plants and producing plants and altering genetic plants that we can produce much more um, if we decide to. And when they decide to, they do it, like they just say the anti-cancer drugs. You know, there was no problem in developing vinca alkalis, right? And vinca alkalis, there are more than 100 alkaloids in the vinca species. But that was good enough. So, the political nature of drug developments in, you know, this is so, so convoluted. But of course, being dependent of a third world country and blah, blah, people don't like that, right? So, but w my lecture is structured in a way that I'm using data, pharmacological data, to illustrate my points. But I'm not going to bother you with pharmacology. The, importance is, the important here is not pharmacology. It's, the con it's more the concepts. Be, you know. So um, let me see if I... So I, first, I think we get lost in translation a lot. And it's going to take us a while to know how to listen to the plants. And I've encountered, of course, many of my informants who sure know how to do that. But it's going to take us a while. But we can learn how to talk to people for Christ's sake. You know? And we don't do that. You know? So ethnopharmacology, there's a lot of ethnopharmacology, and Mark mentioned that too, uh, that is based on secondhand information. In our days, it's a copy-paste. There are hundreds, and Mark knows that, that, that dozens of books that are copy-paste for other books. So one mistake in black and white, and then it's multiplied, and it becomes kind of a true. And it's not. It has never been. The other problem is that uh, field work is collected and interpreted by personnel with no biomedical training. I don't, I don't mean to offend anything, anybody here. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But the definition of ethnopharmacology no matter how much you twist it, is that it's a multidisciplinary discipline. So there's nothing wrong of you going there and collecting data, but talk to someone that has a biomedical background and see if whatever you think you or publish what the informant told you so that people can make their own decision about that. So 
one of the reasons I think that we're being clumsy is because the few data is collected wrong, it's published wrong, libraries are built upon misleading information. That's bad, that leads to bad working hypotheses to begin with. So, and then they say, well, you know, there's this ton of money that was uh, trying to this discipline and, and they're not good results. So in my own experience, for instance, I'm, I, I was trained as a, as a neuroscientist, a psychopharmacologist. My PhD was in memory, and then I moved up to the Amazon and for a year, and I stayed 10. And so I was looking for drugs, but I could only uh, look for drugs that I could study, which means CNS. So I was looking for plants that would have a calming effect. And one of the plants that I took to the lab was this plant. And there was no ancillitic properties whatsoever. But then I remember what they told me. And they told me, you know, the person would be calmer. And it would go like always like this, would be calmer, would be calmer. And I look at the plant and they had bradycardiac effect. It means your heart makes your heart beat slower. So, you know, they, they were telling me what the plant was doing. Of course, people that have to present, you know, students that have to present, you have your 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 heart racing a lot or trembling a lot. They can take drugs that do that. Actually, they do take take drugs that helps you because if your heart is not racing and you're not trembling, then you feel calmer. But it's not what an insulinic effect actually is. Um, that's another point. You want to know how your homemade medicines is make because it tells you so much. And what do we do? What do they do, Mark? They take everything to the lab and treat it as if there's no information behind it, you know? So you're out there. You have no resources, right? You have to make the best of that medicine. So what does traditional pharmacotechniques reflect? It's the best way to take from that plant with limited resources the best, what you need from that plant. And, and you can call it, you can call it a pharmacotechnique. It's a traditional pharmacotechnique, if you give them credit. So we all know that there are hundreds of compounds in a plant. When the medicine is prepared with one species, if you look at traditional Chinese medicines, there's several species, dozens of species, right? Even in, in, in the Brazilian Amazon, a lot of medicines are mixtures. So you have hundreds of compounds, but there's only a fraction of those compounds that would be present in the traditional formulation. And that's how they prepare it. It's in cold water. Well, can you boil? Can you not boil? Should you not boil? Is with sugar? Do, do they put ashes on it? This is all chemical information that's completely lost. Completely, it's not lost, it's disregarded. It's not credit for the traditional knowledge. And it set you back, you know, in your chemical lab so much, you know, for no reason. So perhaps the custom, a customized analysis might not be feasible for large scale screening, but even in academic settings, this is very much overlooked. And my ethnochemist, the chemist that happened to move to the Amazon by the time I also moved to the Amazon, so we made a career together. He published a uh, long time ago in, in this book, uh, medical there's a chapter by, by him that analyzes um, what do the traditional form formulations tell you. Can I have a little water, please? So uh, one of the, one of the um, diseases that I came across was this disease that I, as a Brazilian, I've also never heard about. I bet you never heard about. It's called mal de guta. Mal, mal de Parkinson, mal de Alzheimer. So it's disease, okay? So what's mal de guta? There's this entity that lives behind, uh, below the waters in the rivers in the Amazon. And it's a very needy sort of lady. Thank you. And uh, so she's always trying to have company. So if you suffer from mal de guta, you shouldn't fish alone, because if you have a Mao Jiguta episode, you will perhaps lose consciousness. Your arms and legs can make like this, just like the waves of the river or the sea. 
and they're going to be foam in your mouth, just like the foam of the waves. To my psychopharmacology ears, that sounded like a grand mal seizure, right? So 10 out of, uh, 8 out of 10 people you talk to the, to the Amazon, they treat maujiguta uh, with a mixture of these four plants. So it's uh, leaves of fruit, it's a rutacea, this labiata, uh, uh, the leaves of cissocicioides, and the seeds of sesamum indico. You get the fresh leaves, you beat them up, you mix with, beat them up again with sesamum indico, you put through a little tissue and you filter that, and that's the remedy that the person has to take. Okay. If you go to the Vero Peso market, those same plants will be, this is out there in, in the Caboclo village, and this is where she plants it. You know, there's this girau, it's called, and you, you, you put your precious plants out there so that, as they say, pigs, chickens, and kids don't mess it up. <laughs> and, and, and you go to the Vero Peso market, and those same plants are sold, and then they will talk about convolution, which is a distorted way about talk about convulsions. So we started to use the, to, to analyze this. Um, first, first I look at the, at, the, at the formula itself. And it, it didn't prevent the convulsions, but it, it delayed it a lot. And then I started to, to look at the species, the plant species individually. And when we were starting, uh, uh, we were studying the, the labiata one in the traditional way. So, you know, we made an ether and an alcoholic and a blah, blah, blah extract and starting to look at the fractions. And to a technician of my lab, he said, he then, he, he, he pointed out to me, he said, all the, the fractions that are active are smelly, are the fragrant ones. So, oh, so we went back to the essential oils. And guess what? This is why they don't boil the plant. They, they, they want to get rid of the essential oils. And why is sesamum in there? Because there's oils, so it helps to, to extract the oil from that. Linalol was the major component of that essential oils, the oil, and it's also the major component of many that you know, lavender. And the quintessential lavender bath for calming, et cetera, et cetera. So what did we find? We find that it modulates the glutamatergic transmission and the GABAergic transmission. Glutamate is the most ubiquitous and important excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And GABA is the, the same thing, but it's the depressant neurotransmitter in the brain. So you have to have this imbalance. If you have epilepsy or epileptic crisis, it's because either you have too much excitation or your GABA depressant is not good enough to modulate that. So this is, this is how an epileptic, well, this is how it comes about. You know, I'm being simplistic, but so that you understand that linalol modulates both. By the time we did this research, was the, you know, I lived in the Amazon from 81 to 91, and then I went back to the south because I wanted to do some neurochemistry. I couldn't do it in the Amazon. There's so much you can play with agonists and antagonists to characterize a drug. So by the time we published that, there were no anticonvulsants in the market that would play with glutamate. The newer anticonvulsants now do that, but so multiple mechanism of actions. So we thought, well, we, would that be active if inhaled? Could that be the basis of some aromatherapy? So we devised this um, uh, little apparatus and the mice can, be, can, would stay there and we know that they sniffed, smelled that uh, essential oil for a certain amount of time. You can actually measure by putting a needle here that outsource linalol and then you put in an HPLC and then you quantify that. So you know how, how much uh, compound they, they, they inhale. And what did we find? It lowers body temperature, it decreases locomotion, just like the depression of CNS should do. It increases the sleeping time. 
and uh, de decreases aggressive behavior. Well, first, you know, this is a little, this is called the light and dark test. It's very simple. Mice are very white and they don't see well and they're nocturnal. So they, li they don't like to be here because this is counter adaptive. They like to be in darker place. So you put, it, put them here, but they want to know what's in the other side of the little door because they're curious and they, and they also are trying to get the hell of there, right? So they want to know, they don't know what's going to happen, so they, they need escape route. So by doing this, uh, uh, if you treat the mice with diazepam or any other ansiolytics, it will go faster because it's a conflict before it's unknown and I want to see what's in there. And also they're going to stay more time in the not so good, in the light zone, right? So it's a very simple test. So we, with linalol ingested like this, it, it, they spend more time in the light compartment. Either if they, we just put them there or if you, you, we stress them before with music or light or whatever, you stress them before. And again, they're going to be more relaxed. And importantly, this, is, this measures motor coordination. So this is called the rotor road test. It rotates in a certain velocity. So if a mice is okay, it would adapt and then be there and walk along with the rotating bar and don't fall. If it's under psycholytics, they probably fall. If they're under, uh, you know, two depressants, uh, they would actually fall. With diazepam, they fall. But with linalol, they don't fall. So, you know, you're less aggressive, you're calmer, and you don't have a motor coordination product. So, you know, I used to say, and, and Glenn would understand why, we would understand why, I used to say, this is perfect for car aromatizers in Brazil. You know, Brazilians kill thousands of people per year because we drive like maniacs, you know, and we, we, we fight like each other. That's another argument about how clumsy have we been, you know. We still believe in the magic bullock fairy tale because commercially that's what it's important, right? It has been spoken before, the entourage effect, right, in, the, in, in, this, in this, so I don't have to go about it. But, you know, we know so many examples, and it, they're not unknown examples. It's been proven over and over with very, 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 very known drugs in the market that there's no component in ginkgo that works alone better than several components, the same in ginseng, the same in kava kava. So I don't know why are we going back to this all the time. So uh, you don't have to say anything, you know, just campo, ayahuasca for, you know, campo, TCM, anything. So even in, tradi even in Western, modern, contemporary uh, pharmacology, these concepts have been changing. So now it's trendy in mainstream pharmacology to talk about multiple mechanisms of action, network pharmacology, you know, uh, people who come up with these, uh, uh, with these uh, uh, terms are, are cited now hundreds of and thousands of times. They never read phytomedicine. They never read a paper on phytomedicine of the Journal of Ethnic Pharmacology. This is for us, none of, none of us here is, 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 would blink about this. You know, this is old news for us. It's, it's very new news for, for Western pharmacology. It's good news for everybody. But, you know, I mean, you know, why are we going back here? Disease, it's now understood as a process. Not even in physics, uh, we talk about cause effective anymore. And physics is the mother of science, right? Mother of the discipline. So it's determination rather than causality. It's the current and extended interpretation of cause effect relationship, even in physics, in, in, the, in, in, in pathology and, and, and biology is the same. Cause is substituted by determined conditions, conditions in plural. 
where all the conditions of, a process, uh, of the process or state are equally important for something to happen. So I can carry the gene for breast cancer, but that doesn't mean I'm going to have breast cancer or how aggressive my breast cancer can be, right? So you hear it over and over, it's a complex interaction between genetic and environmental issues. So it depends if you smoke or if you don't smoke, if you do exercise, if you're happy, if, uh, if you're sexually happy, if you believe in something. There's so many confounder, um, confounder variants that have been proven to modify uh, the the, condition, the, the underlying cause of the condition, like genes. Psychotria, uh, I've studied psychotria. It's not Colorado, though I published, uh, I studied psychotria, especially psychotria like colorata, but many other species, including a psychotria viridis that have no DMT at all. I'm sorry to say, but. Um, we, came, I, I, we came across this, this, we made a survey of plants that were used as analgesics among caboclos in the Amazon. And out of the 23 recipes, we thought this, this was more interesting. It's called Pepeto do Mato. Pepeto means forever. So it's always flowering in, in, in their bushes. They're kind of like these tall bushes, especially in flooded areas. So you better collect it in a canoe that they're walking in there. The flowers, and we wonder why not, the leaves are bruised and mixed with milk, and if better, it's, it's better if you have mother's milk, wrapped in banana leaves, heated, you make a little patches on banana leaves, and then you put it over stones that have been previously heated in a fire and covered with ashes that are still hot enough but not burning hot. Then you open your package, and from there you extract a liquid through a cloth or something you can put in your toothache or earache. So we thought various, others, uh, various other uh, medicines that were used for pain would be woman pain, women pain, for instance. Women pain talks more about, you know, most of relaxant and, you know, we, we use buscopan, etc. So from this plants, you know, first we collect the leaves because there's just so much more leaves than flowers, right? Extremely toxic. It's same alkali, they, they also had alkalis, but extremely toxic. So the, they'll tell us why they use the flowers. From this flower, we isolated several alkaloids. One of these alkalis, uh, Christopher has given his lecture, so help me out, uh, he helped me too. But you know, in order to, to study analgetic, you have to inflict some pain. It's a controllable pain. You, you, you make sure that you don't damage the, the tissue. But, so this is tail flick. But you put a little source of heat that heat reaches the tail of the mice. And when it gets hot, the mice simply tick it off the, the heat source. So um, it's called tail flick. So uh, you can see here, and this is uh, the effect, you can see that vehicle doesn't do anything. This is morphine, increases the time for the mice to feel the pain and tick the flick and the tail, and flick the tail. And, and here's this alkaloid, Hodgkin Sina, and you can see that it works at a proper dose, five milligrams per kilogram, it works like morphine, right? It's the same pattern. If you treat that with an opioid antagonist, you lose, lose, you lose the activity. So that means you, the analgesic effect is true, um, true opioid. This is binding, this is morphine. Oh, I'm sorry, this is morphine, and this is Hodgkinsin. So yes, it's, it's an opioid-like drug, but it's not only that. This is another, um, this is the pepper. Capsaicin is the pepper, the active principle in the pepper. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't deal with opioid, it deals with glutamate. Again, the citatory amino acid glutamate. And again, our alkaloid shows um, effect on, 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 on this test. 
And this is glutamate binding. It's not really glutamate, but it, it tells about glutamate binding. So yes, this, this is a dual mechanism of action. Another alkaloid in the same plane, cyclotridine now, again, the same test, but when you, you know, there's analgesic tests like morphine, but when you treat it with naloxone, you don't lose the, you don't lose the activity. So it's not morphine, and yes, it's not morphine. You know, it's, it doesn't bind to morphine. But when we do the capsaicin, and yes, it's capsaicin, and then we can see again the binding. So two alkaloids, the first one with two mechanisms of action, and a mechanism of action that can help you by, by having glutamate interfering with the opioid activity, you don't, you might interfere with the need to increase the dose and get addicted to it. So, and this is, so this is just uh, from one plant. So, two alcohol, well, I already said that. So, so why we keep going back to the, you know, to the magic book fairy tale? There are other alkaloids in there we haven't studied it. Uh, one of the reasons I like that, that, uh, that study that, I, I don't know, we published until, I don't know, mid-2000s. And, you know, here's a 2007 paper, but just before coming here, I saw other, another paper that was being published. So people find these, um, these alkaloids, the structure very interesting, and they, come, they keep uh, producing derivatives. So, you know, it might get somewhere. The other problem is posology. There's no pharmacologist in the world that would discuss a drug without discussing posology. But then you go to the field and you don't collect that. How long, how long is, is, is that drug to be taken? How many times a day you take it? How much do you take it? You know, we rarely see this, you know, unless it's a good acting pharmacologist that is writing the paper. So, um, the lack of correspondence between traditional use and laboratory, it's, what are you doing? You know, if your hypothesis is that that medicine, that someone, that remedy, if you wish, that someone told you about, and you're making a working hypothesis, you're going to test that hypothesis, you might as well do it right, right? So, um, Beptopulp is a Kayapa. I worked with the Kayapa Indians for, for some time. Beptopulp was, uh, he's, a, he's a Wayanga, he's a shaman. And uh, the Kayapa have the Mikutepi Jamari, those who know a lot of medicines. And you know, they, they would see what you, what you have and, and give you medicine. And then there are the Wayangas. Wayangas are the real shamans and they made a journey and they become Someone said diplo diplomacy with the, with the entity that that that's affecting the patient. So, Beptopu and uh, when I would ask Beptopu, and how much and how do you take this? And he would go like three times a day, or he would like two times a day, or he would just one time, and he would make. Uh, sometimes I was uh, nagging this, this another Indian, Kuraka, to tell me about the dosages, and he made these little cups with, with leaves. You know, a big leaf would make a little cup, you know, those cups, you know, just round the leaves, and then it become a little cup. And he explained to me, you know, if this is a, is a baby this big, you give this, and if this, this is it. They know what they're talking about, you know, it's just that we don't listen. So there's nothing, well, you can do that, but you cannot then say that you've studied that plan. That's what makes me angry. You know, you can say that you did that, but you didn't test the hypothesis of traditional knowledge. Now, this is a paradigm shift paper in psychopharmacology published in 96. What Hyman and Nestler show is that it's not like drug effect. You have a drug, interacts with the receptor, and then you have the effect because of that interaction. That's the acute effect of a drug. But in CNS, it's not really, the it, it story doesn't end there, you know? 
here's where you get to the college or, or you know, high school, whatever, and you get a beer and you fill the beer and that's it. Then if then you are at university and you start drinking every day, you're, and so it's, it's the same stimuli, it's, it's the drug, but the repetitive, repetitive stimuli to this same receptor eventually makes the, the whole tissue becomes different. An alcoholic brain will never be a non-alcoholic brain again, right? So, or, or you, you start taking morphine for pain and then, and then it becomes a tragedy, right? So, this is why, this is one of the reasons why I think it's a legitimate question to understand how microdosing works. You know, I resent a little bit that I was kind of, you know, that my question was received as if I was doing just an academic question. And I am an academician. And the reason I think it's important because if microdosing works and you understand how microdosing works, I then ask, I can ask, should, an intractable epileptic patient, should, it, should this patient be treated with much lower doses of the anticonvulsants that we know? Should an uh, intractable or repetitive or resistant depression, should those patients be treated with microdosing of antidepressants that we know? And would microdosing work outside the CNS? Can we treat diabetes and hypertension with 40 times less drug than we're taking it now? I mean, the pharmaceutical company would be delighted, right? But from my stand of view, if we're looking at a better world and well-being, then yeah, this is a very legitimate question because it's paradigm shift, and I agree it's a paradigm shift, you know, but it, it has consequences, it can be Great consequences to it. So, um, but for ethnopharmacology, what does that mean? It means that to begin with, in vitro methodologies are inadequate if they're read by the face value. There's nothing wrong with doing binding, Dennis. There's nothing wrong. But after you know if this works in vivo, because the binding, you know, it's not enough to bind to, to a target to become a drug, right? There are hundreds of compounds that bind to the serotonin to a receptor and they're not psychedelics, you know? And I'm, um, I'm not brave enough, but since Dave is not here, I'm gonna disagree with him because he said, well, psychedelic drugs are psychedelic because they bind there. No, there's much, much more to psychedelics that we just don't understand, right? So, Behaviors models, so you know, more often than not, in vitro methodologies are done, especially in countries that are rich and that are far from biodiversity and so biodiversity. And behavior models with good predictability are suitable to initiate investigation. But for drug development, we then have to move to, to more translational kinds of uh, investigation as well. We have to pay attention. You see how many parts of other lectures are coming in? Mm -hmm. So this is another ethnopharmacology example that exemplifies exactly that. You know, I was working in Nigeria in an ethnopharmacologic expedition for shaman pharmaceuticals, was not interested in CNES whatsoever at that time. And uh, we were talking in the Igbo land. The Igbo are a tribe of more than two million people, but they're organized in small kingdoms. And we met a king that said, oh, that we told them what we, they, we were doing. And he said, oh, you got to come and see the doctor, my doctor, the doctor of my kingdom, because he's very famous. So we went there and, and met Dr. Shidi Ozondo, whose card tells you a lot of things that he does, but includes medicines, I love the et cetera. And when he sat here, he said, 
who he finally sat there, he said, this is my office. To get there, we went through this part, you know. Those are, you know, like voodoo dolls, and those are hanged animals, so the place was filthy and was bad smelling, and you had voodoo, and you have the Last Supper, and you even have the Havi Shankar here, so the client is always right kind of thing. And, but then he started to tell me about the treatment that he does, what mad people get there. And there were, we were with our Nigerian colleagues that were really, really scared. And he was a little, he, he was a sweetheart at the end, but he was a little scared because he would use gunpowder and do, you know, in these settings. And uh, me and Tom Carlson, someone talked about Tom Carlson, me and Tom Carlson, we were calmer because we have more of a distance from all that, right? And I distinctly remember looking at it and saying, if I was at the movies, I would think that the uh, sonographer was too heavy handed because it's a little too much, you know? But then he starts telling me about this, you know? And he would treat the patient, and depending on the, on the, the, the state of the patient that arrived in the clinic, and then he would treat take down the dose. And it all made very much sense to me. And then we moved to his clinic, which I obviously didn't photograph because of the patients, but it was a brick, white house, spotless clean, big windows, big doors, and the patients would be lying there in, in the straw mattresses, and they would, they're very polite in Nigeria, it's a British colony, and they would stand up from the, from the mattress, and I could see they were not, they, they didn't have any, any blood pressure product, problems, because they would rapidly stand up and be there and not be like, whoa. And so it was not real phobia, and, and they would interact with you as, you know, we were living and they would go, look, have a good journey. So it was not neuroleptic, the old antipsychotic drugs that don't make, if you remember, the cook in the nest, you know, that, you know, you don't interact with the environment. So to make a story, sh uh, uh, no, so we make a little extract, a chemist uh, put, they do that, you know, put on the tongue and he said, this has alkaloids. So we studied that, I'm not gonna go into details, but what I wanna show attention, this is, this is, quite in a specific, if it's specific test, you see it's protection, so, you know, control doesn't do anything. This is haloperidol, the very, very, very old antipsychotic. As you can see here, diazepam phenobarbital doesn't work here, but the antipsychotics, older or newer, work. And here's austenine, and I, you know, because then we realized this, this was the alkaloid that was the major com component. I started with 20 milligrams. All of you that are pharmacologists, 20 milligrams is not too much to start a, 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 an experiment. And we got none, none, none effect. And I, and I keep thinking about what I saw there and I said, that cannot be. And then he done to me, of course, you know, with the preparations that I saw that wouldn't extract as much as 20 milligram per kilogram. So I went down to two milligram, one milligram, and 0.5 milligrams, and Christopher would agree with me, intraperitoneal uh, administered, this is a minute quantity because it's only a fraction of that that we get to the brain. So maybe, maybe we're talking about something like microdosing. It's not really, it's, a, it's more like a very small dose. Um, so if you compare the newest at the time, the newest uh, antipsychotic clozapine and austenine, you see there's a pattern, right? So it's much closer to newer antipsychotic to typical antipsychotic. To this day, I feel sorry for the PhD that was doing this work. She would show me the data and I wouldn't believe it. You know, from that setting that the working hypothesis was, is this an antipsychotic? But then it was an antipsychotic and I couldn't believe it. So I would tell her, do it again. You know, she did most of the experience twice. So um, with, you know, this is all published, it's a new mechanism of action and uh, it has some advantages actually vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, some of the antipsychotics. And the mechanism of action is just natural products. So, you know, it does play with 5-HT2A receptors, but we, we don't really know exactly how. 
it is a 5-HC agonist, a positive modulator, increases dopamine uptake. A problem, one of the problems with schizophrenia is that you have too much dopamine in certain parts of the brain. What have we done for 50 plus years? We block dopamine receptors and then it messes up the brain. It doesn't, re it, it, it solves part of the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem of schizophrenia. It takes care of one of the domains of schizophrenia, the, the so-called positive hallucinations, deliriums, aggression, but it doesn't make them work properly because it doesn't improve cognition or the so-called negative uh, symptoms. Uh, so this is a very elegant way to diminish dopamine where it's too much without blocking the receptor entirely. Does not block, this is the first antipsychotic that doesn't mess directly with dopamine receptor. So if, if this is not called uh, innovation, then I know what it's called, right? Um, that's something else. We put the cart before the horse. I don't have the time to go to all this, but this as, as an illustration, you know, so it's a very nice work. It's Anna Yager was uh, a very good researcher. She, you know, it's plants from uh, South Africa. You know, the descriptions led her to believe that there might be antidepressants. 34 medicinal species, 75 extracts, and then goes to serotonin, like Prozac drugs, five positive reads, discard two of them because she felt that they have uh, components that would be not good in the long term, then some behavior tests, and then bioguided fractionation, you know. And then I ask, you know, were the traditional remedies used for long periods of time? Have we just thrown away the long, possibly fast-acting antidepressants? You know, could any of the drugs be pro-drugs? That they only be drugs after being injected? You know, what does an in vitro test tell you about all this? Mostly none, mostly nothing. You know? So um, that's what I call uh, putting a horse uh, before the cart. Again, turning down but not off. You know, we just heard it today, very similar words. You know? But this is a new, this is a, a, a new insight in, uh, in psychopharmacology and has been published, or, uh, has been published in Nature. It's that it's like I said about the, the dopamine receptors. You know, in degenerative uh, diseases, cells are attacked by several hyperactive pathways. Right? We cannot shut it down entirely because then the, the, the person will function, function even worse than it's functioning because of the disease. So we have to tune it down, but not shut it off. Right? In order to do that, you have to have drugs that work smoothly in the receptors. So drugs that only block the excess activity, that adjust, adjust the, vol the volume, that have low affinity and don't stick there. They do the job and leave the receptor open again. Memantine is one of these drugs, you know, drug that's used for Alzheimer's as well. And he, he, oops, he goes uh, further to say that it's a simple co um, concept that can be uh, you know, extended to many uh, other diseases in CNS, and he said maybe perhaps out of CNS. This is also a very well-known uh, drug in the Amazon. It's used for tremors, sexual dysfunction, you can, to, to recover for, from stroke, fatigue, anorex, anorexia. And it's called Marapuama, and of course, it's much better known for being an aphrodisiac. But um, what have we discovered with that plan? And I haven't studied that part, so don't ask me about it. But CNS, why? This is mice that are, um, were orally dosed, and there are all dots, and this is a memory test, and you can see the memory is improved. I don't have time to show you better. And this is aging mice, 14 months old guys. So this is an adult guy. This is the aged guy. You know, the memory is a bit, it's, it's 
it's not doing well. And this is the age guy treated with our um, brain tonic, which is used for nerve weakness. The first time I wrote a grant for nerve weakness, I can't, the referee came back with telling me all the parts of the brain, but I said, I didn't know anything, you know. And I was turned out for a Fulbright because of this. So I wrote two copies and I said, you know, this guy doesn't understand anything about what I'm saying. And he said, why don't you apply for the U.S. Fulbright? And then I got my Fulbright. So, you know, this is, this is still a very, uh, it's not really considered a very good science, as you know. So we also found that that drug diminishes, uh, oh, improves memory in mice that were treated with the beta, alpha beta amyloid, you know, the stuff, the part of the problem with Alzheimer. So you can see here, this is the guy, this is the normal guys. Those are the guys that were treated with the Alzheimer induced, I'll put it that way. So the memory disappeared. And these guys were treated with Alzheimer induced, but with also with our drug. And, you know, is if, is, it is as if it didn't. So it prevents the Alzheimer induced loss of memory. We also find that, that you know, there are less deposits of that and less neuronal death. Um, it's antioxidant, it does a lot of things. Another thing that I think we do wrong is that we know too little about too many. So there are, you go to a, you go to a, a congress of ethnopharmacology and natural products and there are 500 papers, you know, 470 different species. Because there's, there's a thing in our field that, you know, the sexy thing is to, to study the unknown plan that this weirdo shaman talked about once, you know. In order to, do, to for drug development, you know, you have to make a case. Now, what is being developed into drug? You tell me, ayahuasca, psilocybin, mescaline, cannabinoids. Those are not known drugs, right? So we have to change that. You know, we have to add knowledge to each of these species to make a good case for, uh, for drug development. Um, needless to say, you know, lots of uh, masters and PhDs, and this is 40 years of work that I've shown, we had a lot of fun. And I'll, I'll end that by saying that, you know the concept of the dead valley in drug development? You all know that. You don't know that? So there's the big problem is coming from basic science to patients. 95% of the drugs that are discovered when they tried in, you know, they work out in vitro, perhaps in vivo, in mice or rats, but when it comes here, there's uh, acute heart failure, acute liver failure, acute kidney failure, right? So they don't, they don't go further. It's, it's called the valley of death, of drug development. Now, what does ethnopharmacology do? You talk to a person, right? Now, what drugs, what remedies, traditional medicines that cause liver, cardiac, or renal failure, acute, now, they're not going to be there. You're not going to talk to your neighbor. You don't say drink it. You don't pass uh, this information along, right? So I think, I, I still believe it after so many years working with that, that it's a great advantage to work in that from ecology for drug development. And we can pass that because we do, we don't do bench to bed, we do bed to bench. You know, we have people who say, you know, that there's no reason to believe they're lying to you. Of course, I'm making it simple because magic, because, you know, because there's, but this is our problem. This is ethnopharmacology. pharmacology. It's your problem to, to figure that out, you know. And drug development is not a trivial endeavor, you know. Even for, look at this information. For the 10 of the U.S. best-selling drug, you have to treat between 4 to 25 patients to come up with a good response. This is a trustworthy system, right? 
This is the FDA approved drugs, right? But if you do one or two experiments, it doesn't go with the wrong pathology, with the wrong everything, and that it doesn't work, and traditional medicine is not good for anything, right? So it's, it's, there's something really, really wrong here. So again, this guy was spoken about the last meeting, uh, right? This um, Burton Grass. I met Burton Grass and Jacques Foucault uh, in a meeting in Switzerland. And they weren't happy with hanging their posters along with other posters that nobody go and see. So they hang it by a stair, you know, on the top of the stair that you were obliged to go to go to lunch. So you couldn't miss it. And the poster was called, why would you invest in a, a medicine, in a plant medicine without knowing if it works? So those are medical doctors. He's actually a psychiatrist. And another person is Merlene Wilcox, who works here. And what they do is they go and talk to people. You know, they claim what they do is to do they do observational clinical analysis or retrospective clinical outcomes. You can go to houses and you say, "Do you have malaria? What did you treat it with it?" You know, and then he makes a statistical analysis about that. He goes to or, or, or snake bites, and then he goes to the hospitals, local hospitals way there in Africa and Latin America. And then he correlates, you know, the patients that get there, do they get better? Or, you know, the, the snake bite get there with a worsened, better shape? And they do that in order to uh, select the species that they should, uh, you should invest or to develop improved drugs, as they call it, local drugs. So, um, I say that you know the failure to incorporate the tail traditional use, the choice of the workflow, the limited use of experimental models, the mis you know, those are misused time and resources. You know, I mean it's okay. It's okay in academia, you know, you train people in PhDs and masters and blah blah, but not for drug development, you know, and not for concluding that medicinal plants do not work, you know. And why do pharmaceutical companies still invest in high throughput screening and not that in pharmacology? High throughput screening, which I personally call high tech, no brain technology. Think about it. You know, it's hero, it's, it's finding the hero, and, and, and it doesn't work. It's pathetic. Hundreds of millions, right? So, we, um, this is wrong, this is April 14, I, we, 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 I edited a volume along with colleagues, uh, a volume in front of psychiatry. This is a mainstream CC, you have to pay $2,000 to publish one original paper. When they asked me if I would uh, edit something, I said, well, if I can put this word there, you know, if you can, I, I said, if I, can if I can edit this volume, then I, then I, I do. So uh, there was, I look at, again, before coming here, and it was 61,000. I don't have a Facebook account, so I don't know how much this is, but it, it sounds like a lot to me, right? And this is a mainstream psychiatry journal. And um, I have, I'm, I'm sorry, just one second, okay? This is our resource, social biodiversity. It's not really biodiversity. Biodiversity is good to high throughput screening. It's not going to lead anywhere. Social biodiversity, the people who know what these plants are good for, right? And the obtuse brute that took power in Brazil. And I have to call your attention for that. The mining in indigenous land tripled, no, it tripled in the last five years, doubled in the last three years under this guy, unspeakable, because I don't say his name anymore. And so th this is my, look at this river. Look at how much mining. It. So now 93% of the, one of the Indian tribes, the, the villages that were, it's green here, it's their mercury, their mercury poisoned. It's nothing else, nothing less than genocide. And this is deforestation, the rate of deforestation, I don't have to talk about it, you've been reading. I'm sorry to show you this picture, but 
this is what happened in Pantanal. This is a world prize winning picture. And indigenous people in Brazil are having the most organized voice against this government. The left, the opposition, we were like, whoa, what happened? We were perplexed, unorganized to go back to dictatorship. We didn't think that this would happen again. So we were completely unorganized. Not, but the Indians, they were organized. So they, they're becoming one of the most organized voices. This is Brasilia, you know, the capital of the country. And this is their camp, the Terra Livre free land camp. And I like that a lot of times they put the planet on it because it will affect the climate change, certainly, and all the rain regimen in the whole planet, right? So I, I, you know, I think that the, the International Society of uh, Ethnobiology Code of Ethic and the now old but still very, very relevant letter of Belen, Belen Declaration, it's, it's utterly important for all of us that work with traditional medicine and um, international attention do make a difference. So I ask you please to don't stop paying attention and talk about it. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisbitsky. We have time for two questions. I see one right here. That was incredible, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask what place you think home herbalism has in healthcare, or potentially has in healthcare? In, uh, well, it, globally, home health, like home herbalism, people learning. Well, well, there's a in Brazil the 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 public system, and we have a, a public uh, system that's uh, not as good as we wish for, but save us in COVID. And um, there's a there's a palette, they, they call it now, a palette, it's a, a, you, you have a choice of treatments. So you can get there and, and, and choose to be treated with homeopathy or medicinal plants, or, or, or I think it's 23 options right now. I mean, it's, it's not the major thing, you know, but um, this is another plan, thank you for asking, because, you know, I don't think we should shy You know, it's not, it's not going to be there for everybody. You know, in, in Sao Paulo, one of the highest rate of depression and anxiety among women that are poor and became the head of their families so that they have to feed their kids and they're afraid of violence and don't even know if their kids are going to come back because you know, Sao Paulo became so violent. So high indexes of anxiety and depression. These people, if they can go to the public health system and get a drug, a component, either it's psilocybin or whatever, you know, I'm, I for one am happy about it. So, it varies in different countries. Thank you. Last question. So in the, in the absence of uh, shaman pharmaceuticals and in the picture that you painted of the direction of academic research and, and, and research that the pharmaceuticals are doing, um, what gives you hope in the sort of commercial direction of, of, of research and drug development? This. My, My husband usually, usually he loves the phrase that says, that says if I can say it in English, is, yeah. you, you cannot, cannot underestimate the ability to screw with, with a good idea. idea. Right. <laughs> so we, we didn't know what, what the pharmaceutical company would do with any, any of these. But, but the, the only, only thing that we can do is to continue to do, do good, good science and be ethical, ethical about it and, and come, come up with good ideas to then make it uh, you, you know, know available, available to, to a wider, wider population. population. 
So uh, my friend Janice Thompson, who you may know, who used to be head of the Marine Natural Products Division at the National Cancer Institute, and then subsequently worked for different pharmaceutical companies. So we were talking about, you know, the, the tremendous abundance of undiscovered molecular structures in nature and the potential to find truly novel drugs because, as you know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is plagued with this problem of me tooism you know, you discover one antidepressant, pretty soon 10 pharmaceutical companies have come out with another SSRI with, you know, minor molecular tweaks on the molecule, but basically the same thing. No money is being, very little resources are being put to discovery of truly novel structures or novel mechanisms, and uh, uh, even, even though, though we know, know that the, the natural world contains these things. Uh, 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 but the, the, the she, she said, uh, um, so, so why are resources, resources being put toward this? this? You, you know, because, because we, we now have much better techniques for isolating compounds, doing in vitro assaying and so on. Her answer was blunt and disappointing. It was pharmaceutical companies want to own everything. And it is much, they're in their perception, even though things like combinatorial chemistry and these sorts of synthetic approaches have yielded very low results for drug discovery in terms of discovery from discovery to the clinic. But they don't want to muck with the whole issues about intellectual property and the, and the, the, the much more, the greater complexity of you know, collecting plants, isolating them, doing all these bioassays. But what it comes down to basically is they just want to own the space, you know, and the mobilization of resources towards, say, setting aside uh, large tracts of the rainforest paid for by the pharmaceutical company for wild prospecting rights, they're just not interested. Is, is what it comes down to. It's an economic calculation. How can we create those incentives for the pharmaceutical industry to, to recognize the potential of natural products, or is there a way? Uh, what I think is the crisis, right? the, the whole blah, blah, the crisis or possibilities, is just a crisis within the pharmaceutical industry, especially with CNS. I mean, I mean, you, you go, go to a Congress, Congress on schizophrenia, or, and, and there's, there's their, 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 their entire mornings or afternoons with workshops about that, because they shy away. Same, same thing with neurodegenerative diseases, you know. know. Like, like a, they spend a lot of money, money and, and, and new, new things don't come up. up. So, so I think that by publishing innovative, innovative mechanism of action of natural products, products it does raise, uh, I mean, attention at least. But if that, probably they would do a synthetic derivative of whatever is being, you know, that's part of the thing. So I think it's a case for natural products, and the hardest part would be to give credit to tradition and knowledge. And, 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 and make, make a, a you know, fair, fair compensation, compensation and all that. that. But uh, how to call attention? attention? I, I think we can. can. Like, like pharmaceutical companies, companies, the big pharma bought very old and established herbal pharma just, just to kill them, them. Right? right? So when the, the and it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's very dirty. So, so, you know, I, I obviously don't, don't have an answer, answer. you know. Jaguar Pharmaceutical is trying to do that. I like come up with ethnobotanists as an ethnopharmacologist and, and come up with leads and then get that into drug development, you know. know. Would, Would that lead to benefit sharing if it's, you know, there are people with the right mind and right heart, but as drug development goes further and further. The right mind and the right heart, not enough resources because it takes hundreds of millions of dollars. Then you get a partner. A single drug yeah. from the forest to the bedside. Yeah. This, this is why I love microdosing. 
if we were right about it, and if it's a, it's a, it's a new paradigm, and if it can be applied to other drugs, it's, it's, if, 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 if the data is paramount, it forces the big pharma to, to cut down costs. Even, even then, we can think, you know? But, but I, I don't know. know. I, I think, think it's the same, same problem with psilocybin and you know, with the other other drugs. drugs. You, you don't know how this is going to play. play. We, we don't know how this is going to play. It's, it's kind of ironic, you, see, you know, that the, the, the rate of discovery of new compounds in the CNS area is so low. There hasn't been anything new for, you know, 20 years. I mean, very little. Um, and then all of a sudden we're quote-unquote rediscovering these ancient compounds which have been around forever which turn out to be the best treatments we have for the, for the psychological illnesses of our time. That's, yeah, yeah, but that's, that's okay within the pharmacy. I cannot remember the repurposing. Repurposing is a term that's acceptable in the, pharma, in yeah. the big pharma. So you can repurpose a drug for other things. But you know, if you come up with really good science, with a new and innovative mechanism of action, uh, because, because they, they don't, don't have, have alternative. alternative. I, I think, think it would call attention, attention yeah. you know? All right. Thank you so much.